In this lecture, we'll be learning about maybe negative examples of word studies. In other words, just as we should know how to do a word search, here we'll be talking about how not to do a word search. Because very frequently in the, in the pulpit, in Bible studies, even in publications, I hear very poor argument or articulation of a word, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and how we should understand them. Here, we're going to be talking about several pitfalls of word studies. To illustrate how words can be misleading, I would like to do a quiz. Growing up in Japan, we actually have many English words that are borrowed from, of course, America or maybe Britain. But it seems like certain things take on its own meaning in Japan. These words, in other words, carry a different connotation. For example, when you think about the word mansion, what do you think? I bet most English spe speakers would think that a mansion is a very lavish, large house. But do you know what mansion means in Japan? Surprisingly, if you use the word mansion in Japan, you're going to get a completely different sense of a thing or meaning because in Japan, Manshon usually means your apartment complex. That's not your apartment building or room that you rent, but the entire building itself. Of course, you can see some similar notions that in both the English term mansion and the Japanese word manshon, it talks about a large building, but the similarity kind of ends there because there's nothing lavish about maybe a particular apartment complex. Here's another example of maybe how some certain English term goes on to have its own meaning, or maybe how certain words were poorly misunderstood and became the norm in a secondary culture or context. Here, we have a word called Viking. For English speakers, we know who Vikings are. There are these warrior class um, from Europe. But do you know what Viking means if you say something like this in Japan? The word Viking sometimes, of course, can refer to the Viking, these warriors, the historic um, people group. However, commonly in Japan, if you say the term Viking or Viking, it actually means a buffet, a all-you-can-eat meal. Of course, you can maybe sort of get where they might have gotten this idea that maybe these original Vikings just ate a lot. Um, they would pillage in and take everything and eat everything. But... Very seldomly, if I use the word, let's go to a biking in Japan, people would ever think that we're going to go to a museum or go, to go see warriors. They know that what's implied here is food, lots of it. So here you can see that depending uh, on the context and language, certain words can get its own meaning. And perhaps maybe if you say a certain term uh, English term in Japan, it doesn't really mean what it meant originally in English. This is eye-opening because you actually find out that even with biblical languages, sometimes similar things happen, and especially in the church, you might be saying like a certain Greek or Hebrew term means this, but in fact, it actually doesn't. Let's talk about these mistakes. The New Testament professor, D.A. Carson, famously wrote this book called Exegetical Fallacies. In fact, this book was so well received that if you use the expression exegetical fallacies in a seminary or Bible school context, almost anyone, Bible professor, would know what it means. Exegetical fallacies happen when people are doing maybe a word study or, or looking at the, the biblical text in its original language and are coming to false conclusions. They have maybe good intentions, they're trying their best, but somehow in their method and approach, something is erroneous that leads to a conclusion or an interpretation that is completely off and not reflected in the original text. Here's a quote, quote from him. The principal reason why word studies constitute a particularly rich source for exegetical fallacy is that many preachers and Bible teachers know Greek and Hebrew only well enough to use concordances. That is, they communicate maybe a definition of a word without really giving any consideration to its literary context and 
if you know languages, literary context really directs and guides what a certain term means in certain contexts. While many pastors and evangelical scholars might be familiar with D.A. Carson's work, they do not know or recognize that D.A. Carson is actually building upon an observation in a seminal work by an Old Testament Hebrew scholar named James Barr. James Barr, decades before D.A. Carson came out with his book, wrote a book titled The Semantics of Biblical Language. And in this book, he actually is fighting against tendencies, not by pastors, but actually Bible scholars and professors who are falsely making claims and doing poor lexical and, and Hebrew uh, studies in Hebrew that doesn't acknowledge or take into consideration Hebrew grammar and linguistics. While D.A. Carson and James Barr both point to various ways that poor exegesis lead to wrong conclusions, here I would like to focus on two common mistakes people are making. The first one is called the root fallacy. The definition is the placement of excessive emphasis on the meaning of the root of Hebrew words. That is the false belief that the root meaning can confidently be taken to be part of the actual semantic value of any word or form which can be assigned to an in uh, identifiable root. Barr famously names this at the root fallacy. Here, you're actually going to find very common things that pastors are going to say that this certain word originally meant this in Hebrew or this in Greek. This is a very poor way. This is what most of the, what's, what, what most people are doing in this instance is they say, well, I wonder what that word means. Let me look at a dictionary. The dictionary says this, and this is the first entry, so this is what it means. Or they say this word kind of sounds like, look like this certain term, therefore it must mean this other term that was the original. This is completely false. And let me illustrate this. Let's give an English analogy. Here, the term nice, this is something that we use all the time. But did you know that the word nice comes from the Latin nesius, which means ignorant or foolish? So whenever someone says, well, that's nice, oh, he is so nice. Does it mean that that person is ignorant because we all know that the original word of nice is foolish? No, I don't think any English speaker has anything in mind of the original root word or meaning when they're using this term nice. That is because the ancient meaning has become obsolete. Therefore, tracing back a word to its root meaning and believing that root meaning is always implied in the later use is completely false. Let me give you another example. The term nightmare. Mare is actually a female goblin or a devil or evil spirit who sits and suffocates people during their sleep. So when you say, or when your child says, I have a nightmare or I had a nightmare, does it mean that, oh, we know what that means. You must be claiming that there was an evil spirit suffocating you at night. Or are you a Satan worshiper? No. That's not what we mean. We never have that in mind. Most people didn't even know what a mare means. Therefore, in a similar vein, when you're doing a word search, you, you really want to be cautious of making bold statements of one term actually means this, and this imagery or this idea is implied and expressed in this biblical passage. Let me give you an example from the Hebrew. I've heard these examples numerous times in my in the church in various writings or in maybe on a popular YouTube video here people are going to say something along the line of did you know that the word for sin the Hebrew word chata originally means or literally means to miss a mark or go therefore every time you're sinning you're missing a mark well I highly doubt that when the biblical authors were saying chata every time what they're implying is that specifically their people are missing the mark. No, maybe it's an image that can be helpful, but actually it's not really what it means. Chata is simply to sin. Another example might be the term shuv, which can be, can be used as meaning repented. Some pastors would say something along the line of the original language. In the original language, 
To repent means to turn away. Therefore, when you're repenting, you're turning away from sin. I highly doubt that that's really the idea that is behind these terms, nor did the biblical authors always had that in mind. No, repent is to be repentant, of course, to be sorry for what you've done, to confess your sins, but every time it, the term is used does not mean that you should be literally turning away. Another famous error that James Barr pointed out amongst scholars is in what he named illegitimate totality transfer. Yes, I know that's a mouthful. What does illegitimate totality transfer mean? Well, it's when a term may be used in a number of places. That means a term has multiple meanings. But this error arises when the meaning of a word, understood as a total series of relationship in which it is used in the literature, is read into a particular case as its sense and implication there. In other words, this error occurs when you open a dictionary and you see that there are a bunch of various meanings of a certain term. And you're going to say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo," Or you say, well, that sounds better. I like that meaning better. So this meaning must be the right meaning in this biblical text that I am reading. This is completely erroneous. Yes, words can have a wide semantic domain, but usually they're literary and grammatical rules that govern what sense that term is meaning in its specific literary context. So let me give you an example. I see illegitimate totality transfer happen frequently, specifically with the Hebrew word chesed. If you've memorized the definition of chesed, or if you've heard of this term, you probably have learned it as something along the line of loving kindness or steadfast love. That is, this expressed God's steadfast, undying, unrelenting love towards people. Well, that is only partially correct. Because if you actually open a lexicon or do a word study on chesed, you soon find out that yes, it can mean God's grace, favor, and mercy towards people. There is 187 times when it has this meaning. But also, one third of, it, of its occurrence is not God's love towards people, but people's love towards others. And this specifically while it could mean to God, people's love for God, that is extremely rare, and it actually could be people's love towards each other. And not only that, when you even look at it and find the nuances, you find out that it could mean maybe benevolence or mercy, um, but it could also be used in a very negative sense, that there's this negative zeal against others. And when you, in a in an article, in the Journal of Biblical Literature, uh, this is one of the top academic journals in biblical studies, there is an article that talked about how this term chesed could even have this connotation or meaning of having an unexpected attachment. So when you read the term chesed, it doesn't always mean God's loving kindness. In fact, it could actually mean people's commitment or mercy towards each other but it could also have a negative connotation, or it could even have this notion of getting an attachment. These are very different meaning. Therefore, words must be studied on a case-to-case -case basis, and you have to carefully assess what a certain term means in a certain place. And last exegetical error that I would like to talk about is what we call semantic anachronism. Semantic anachronism happens when a late use of a word is read back into earlier literature. This is very easy for us to do, especially as English speakers, because we would be bringing back maybe what we're used to, what a certain term means, when we're reading the Bible itself. Here's an example of semantic anachronism, perhaps in English, because in English, like all languages, Trans transitions and changes throughout time. So does Hebrew. But with English, we can see this maybe with this famous uh, Christmas hymn, What Child Is This? In one of the verses of What Child It Is, it actually says, Why lies he in such mean estate, where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is 
pleading. You actually will probably know that if you probably read or sing this verse to a bunch of teenagers, there'll be giggles because the term ass has really taken on a different meaning in modern English. Of course, in ancient um, English or older English, probably ass everyone universally understood as this referring to a donkey. But in modern English, you can find out that, uh, that ass usually refers to a body part of a human being. Therefore, even recent hymnals have began to change word and swap them in order to be more palatable for modern English speakers. When doing word studies, it becomes critical that you start thinking in the language of Hebrew in, and put yourself in the time, culture, and setting of the biblical authors. And to resist the temptation to bring in what certain words means in modern English into the biblical text itself. For example, a very common expression in the Old Testament is this notion of the fear or fear of Yahweh. The book of Proverbs, in, in fact, says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. In modern English, we think of fear as this idea of something scary or terrifying. Of course, Hebrew, this is a term Yare, can actually co communicate this terror, this fear that's very um, common to what we have. But another expression or meaning that fear has is this awe or respect that you have towards someone else. In an Asian context, this is very easy to understand because in Asian, Asian context, for example, for my context as being a Japanese, I grew up with this respect and maybe fear or awe, trepidation towards your elders or maybe your sensei, your teachers. So there is this idea that it's not simply being afraid, but this is a fear that also involves respect and humbling yourself and knowing um, the position and authority of those above you.